What would you do if I poured you a drink? Would you sit down and talk with me? Lay me your gear and I'll bring you along. We can split the day rate 50 50. Oh, baby, I get by. Oh, and all I need is something to yeah. Oh, I'm gonna get high. Welcome to the Pro EDU Podcast. Talk and drink with your favorite artists. So grab yourself a cold sarsaparilla, take your pants off, kick back, and enjoy. What about you? I'll take comfort in that. All right, we are finally live with the absolutely brand new format of the Pro EDU podcast. I'm joined today with architecture photographer Emma Peter. Emma, thank you for joining us. You're the first guest in this completely new format. Of course, of course, I loved your video. That was pretty awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I'm being told to turn off the video. Never mind. All right. So uh, let us know where you're joining from. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube or on Twitter, you can go to proedu.com and click the live tab. And that is where it will take you to our learn platform where you can watch on the apps. You can ask questions. There's a chat box. Um, and if you have any questions for Emma, if you put them in now, uh, we will ask them at the end. So Emma, uh, you are an amazing architecture photographer and you're based in Vancouver. So I want to kind of back up and kind of hear your story about how you got into photography and kind of what your day to day is like today. Um, yeah, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. I am originally from Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, my journey in photography started from a very early age because my dad was a film cameraman and uh uh, he gave me a camera at six. So my first camera that I lost, actually, this is my one and only camera that I lost, was given to me at six. Um, and uh, to be honest, by by the age of seven, eight, I could do darkroom work. Um, I We didn't have a lot of money, so um, we used to roll our own film. Uh, so I could roll my film in the dark room and uh, then we need to test the film to see how damaged it is because they were old Russian films. So I knew how to do testing of emulsion of film like when I was maybe eight and uh, I was sitting with my dad almost every night um, uh, in the dark room uh, because he was doing additional work um, taking photos. And um, yeah, so this is how it started. It started from very, very early age. I love Bulgaria. I spent a lot of time in uh, Moldova in that area, and we would often go to Sofia. So I, I love that part um, of the world. And Bulgarians were also always very, very welcoming. So um, I, we are, we are there. definitely yeah, like it's a very different lifestyle. So growing it's, up, do you remember very, what type of camera? Um, everybody's um, very was? engaged. I, I had a few and, uh, Russian, so it was it was a fantastic stuff. upbringing, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I I love that part of the world. Do you remember like the brand of camera that it was? Oh my God. I don't remember the first one, but I remember the second one was a Zenit, uh, the Russian Zenit. I went through my entire education in photography because I was in university for years for art and applied photography uh, with a practicum. My parents didn't have 
um, the finances, neither did I, to buy anything that had automatics in it. So everything was manual. And I still have my light meter actually with me, like the old Sikonic light meter. And this is how I used to, this is how I learned. And I know it sounds, this is from a thousand years ago, but it's like, this is just not that long ago. And now when I show light meter, people don't even know what it is. So I feel like there was a, a little bit more of a romantic way of photographing and, and understanding of light and understanding where your mistakes are because when you have only 24 to 36 frames and they matter they they matter so much so i keep reminding myself this nowadays that like taking a photo is not about pressing a shutter a million times taking a photo is about actually a sensation a feeling you need to you need to feel it to to press the shutter it's uh, i call it digititis nowadays everybody presses the button until their finger is not functional. Uh, that's not photography. That's being lazy. That's being really lazy. So like, um, not to offend people, but uh, I truly believe you need to learn to see the light, even if you experience it on your own. Like if you just close your eyes on a sunny day and you just feel how the brightness changes of light, that sensation is so powerful uh, to help you understand lighting. So uh, yeah, so the, I started with very, very, very old cameras. And I remember my mom gave me her entire life savings, which was $900 when I was 22 years old. Um, when I went to Japan to buy my first camera and I entered uh, Shinjuku uh, area with all the digital cameras and all the cameras I've never seen. This is my first going out of Bulgaria. Imagine from Sofia to Tokyo. It's a bit of a culture shock. And so I ended up uh, buying this camera and it was, um, it was amazing. But to this day, I know that this camera is, to this day, I keep it because it was my mom's entire life savings for one piece of equipment. So I never take it for granted. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I actually love the light meter, especially with, you know, video, which is similar, but kind of different, but it really just absolutely allows you to dial in to, you know, the you know, tenth of a stop if you really yeah. want and just really understand how light is affecting your entire scene. And my you know, dad like, used to carry it all the time on his neck. Like there it, he, yeah. it was always on his neck, always like opening it. And I have it, I have it, I have it with me always. Like um it's it's just worth understanding it. And is it still the old school light meter? Have you up updated it's to kind of the new secret? Cool light meter. There's no nothing digital in it. It's just the bulb, and the, you press the metal, and you have to dial everything yourself. And it's uh, it's fantastic. So, what would make you upgrade to a new light meter? It breaking, or are there any features that you're missing out you on? Know, do you know? I think I now know lighting and color temperature so well. I don't. I don't need it. And also, this has sentimental value because. It's something that is left from my dad. Um, so he passed away uh, five years ago. And I feel like those little things that connect me with him still, because our connection was not only as a parent and a child, it was of two creatives. So this kind of keeps me close to him as well. That's awesome. <laughs> so when you walk into a room and you see different lights, do you immediately say like 5,000? <laughs> That's 3,500. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> Yeah, once you turn it on, you can't turn it off. Yeah, no, you know very well color temperature and you can you can sense it. And it actually um, is very strange when you try to talk to people about lights. Even sometimes we enter locations and we ask the homeowners of a home, uh, when is the light streaming in here? And they can't tell you. And I'm always a bit bemused by all of this because we know every single change of light, every single change of color temperature. So I don't think people look at light the way photographers do. So, um, but not totally. Like I, I know even now my light sources, I know exactly what color temperatures they are in my room. That's awesome. So you studied photography. Was was photography your gear uh, degree in college? And if so, uh, like, so did you I have studied, like a, a I went to university. So uh, Sofia has a um, a pretty serious photography education. It has a, it, it has a four year uh, program uh, and then you can continue to a PhD, um, which I started. I didn't. I didn't fully finish. Um, so, like it was four years of pretty much we did everything from lighting to infrared photography. So, 
um, we studied also, like, I mean, cinematography. And like in Eastern Europe, it is a much more of a process. It's not only about all oh, your photograph. You need to learn different aspects of cinematography as well. Um, like, so you work with producers, with directors, with actors, so you can understand the whole process. Um, and uh, we used to, we didn't have strobes when I was, when I was in university, we got them in the last year and I've never touched a strobe like um, until I was what 26 years old. So uh, it was a learning curve there, but we learned with the proper projectors and putting filters on everything. So uh, yeah, it gives you a better understanding that we're super lucky nowadays that we don't need to do all of this. Did you find it uh, for creativity and kind of like breaking the rules of photography? Did you find your teachers to, you know, allow you to do that? Or were they like, no, this is the correct way to do something technical in photography and like, well, not allow you like, to be creative? Well, I have to say it was pretty like strict to stay in the rules because all of our teachers were cinematographers. They've studied like pretty much they've they followed the path of Tarkovsky and all of the all of those big creatives so they tried to break the rules in a very specific way um so so like when I try to do something that is a little bit out of like out of what they expected I remember doing in front of the entire school we had to do at the end of the year a film which was two uh projectors with slide films that actually were um, projecting one after another the slides. So you create a movie like this. So you have to have a script, you have to film, uh, photograph it properly. Then you have to put music, you have to have the transitions properly. So it was a whole massive job. And um, I did mine um, vertically, not horizontally, without even thinking about it. And of course, I didn't, I didn't, my, my teacher never told me, like my professor who was leading our class never told me you're doing something wrong. But the reaction of the jury that was like judging us uh, at the end of each year, we had a full jury, full, the full university will go in the biggest auditorium to watch what you've done. And um, yeah, I heard this crazy noise in the room. I remember thinking, oh my God, what have I done wrong? And then the jury, like afterwards said, or the professors that were judging us said, well, you've done it the wrong way. And I, I will never forget my, my professor who was leading our class came on stage and said, this is photography. It's not cinematography. Uh, but this is the first time I realized that kind of breaking the rules could be people could react so strongly. So I think mine still stayed in their minds for a long period of time while all the others kind of washed away. So so it made me realize that you have to break those rules. If you want to have a reaction from people, if you don't break the rules, you're never going to get it. Also, it is about trying to push yourself. And we can become replaceable, all of us, uh, if we feel comfortable. So discomfort is the way to go. Being this, being being not comfortable in a situation is where you should be every day, every day, not just from time to time. Just put yourself in five minutes of discomfort a day in your professional life. And you're going to see that you're going to start breaking the boundaries so much faster. Um, and this is the difference between people that actually are doing incredible job and people that are really good, but get nowhere. So are you still putting yourself in five minutes of discomfort today? And if so, how are you doing? Oh, every day. I mean, today is going to be a discomfort because I hate dealing with any office things and I'm in office today. So, um, uh, no, I, I am actually. I'm going to photograph uh, tonight and it is a very overcast and gray day. And I realized with architectural photography, you can actually photograph in any weather and do good images in any weather. But again, like my head is going, okay, how am I going to do this? Even now, even after 20 years of doing this, I'm thinking, is it going to work? Is it going to be a good shoot? Because like you have to combine so many elements. But I feel like showing up is the important part. And I'm going to show up tonight and it doesn't matter what's going on, whether it will be pouring rain and I'm going to still shoot. And uh, so this is my discomfort for today is actually making sure that I create um, I'm doing this crazy spa, which is like containers, like um, 
just containers converted into this incredible spa in the center of uh, Granville Island, which is one of our really beautiful tourist areas. Um, so it is very hard to shoot. And I'm going to give it a try in a really not the best weather, but I need to create that almost ethereal sensation and uh, romantic sensation of people going in and wanting to be in this location. So we'll see how it goes, but I have to do it. So for a location like this or when it's overcast, do you have the same lighting kit or the same, do you pack the same way going to every location and then just pull different lights? Or do you pack specifically for that location, not bring everything? I usually bring everything. Um, I bring like all the strobes. We have filters on the strobes as well, if we need them. Um, like in many situations when um, the hardest part is when the designer, the architect on a sunny day in an overcast day. And do you know in Vancouver, I mean, I'm going to Vegas <clears throat> next week. I'm going to to Cabo uh, the following week there. The sun is beautiful. Like, um, But in Vancouver, we have five months of rain. So if you want to create a sunny um, weather, like you need to do it yourself. Uh, it's harder with exteriors, but with interiors, we use a lot of lighting. We stream light from outside um, and then fill it in from inside. So we can create, I can create in complete darkness. I can create a sunny, sunny day. The benefits of so, living in Vancouver, it teaches you. Yeah, I know. It's like you guys are the Seattle of Canada. We are. It so, rains um, a lot. What is your lighting kit? What do you use? And, you know, obviously you're going to need a lot of power. So, um, you know, are you using power packs? Are you using mono blocks? What What's in your kit? Sorry, you broke for a second. Yeah, you broke for yeah, a second. Yeah, no worries. I think, yeah, the our connection might be just a little bit choppy. So yeah. if I break up, yeah, no, no, I'll keep, I'll keep talking. I um, can specifically, think. like, what is your lighting so kit? I use pro photo lights. I use different pro photo lights um, from the airs. I still have some of the airs because they're like the thousand is so, so powerful. Like, it, like I, I need to use it. Of course, we, we like the battery ones as well. The uh, the bees, the te the B10s and all of those because like, they're they're battery with batteries on them so you can move them around really easily. Um, but I still have some of the airs as well because the thousand is a, I mean, I need the thousands as well. I need that power um, as well. And the new with the new lights, you can dial in color temperature. You can do so much more. So, um, so yeah, I use primarily the the Pro Photo lights. Awesome. I think you. I lost you there for a second. Yeah. So, um, in terms Perfect. of modifiers, are you using a lot of reflectors and bouncing light off ceilings, or are you trying to shape light with you know soft boxes and huge? Uh, no, no soft boxes. I think soft boxes are just in only specific locations you can use soft boxes. We are using primarily we're bouncing off um, whatever white surfaces we can find. If we cannot find white surfaces, then we are bouncing because the issue with bouncing in anything but white is color cast. Like, you know, you bounce in wood, you get orange, you bounce in black, nothing happens. So like some of the locations you can avoid using uh, soft boxes, or you have to bounce off a reflector. Uh, but in most cases, we can find a ceiling or you can find somewhere to to bounce. I think it, it just, sometimes I feel a lot of this is for, for show, especially in architecture interior. Like you don't need all of this. You don't need to put huge soft boxes and to delay your entire shoot. You can do this really easily by using, um, by, by just bouncing the light somewhere. Yeah, so... In terms of architecture photography, when did you get into, you know, that genre? And like, how did you know? Like, did you know from an early age, like, this is my jam and this is no. what I want to do? Or what no, led you I wanted this? to be a photojournalist. Like, I wanted to be in war zones. This was my dream. My dream was to be on site recording um, the news somehow. I wanted to work for, for Reuters. I wanted to work like I, that's why I was so... Um, from the very early age, like I aimed for Magnum, I went and I was an intern in Magnum Photo Agency where the top photojournalists were there. A September 11 happened exactly then when I was there. So we saw some of the, the most insane images coming from, from New York at that point. 
Um, and that was my dream. Like my dream was definitely being a news reporter and being in the news. And I was in TV for, for years, but in an entertainment, I was a presenter of an entertainment show. And I, I think that I was always a little bit jealous of the news, um, the news, uh, anchors and like, just, I always wanted to be in news. Um, and then when I came to Canada, um, I just, there was no, there was no options for me here. I was young I was not known nobody wanted to hire me even to go to to anywhere so I started working with Expedia uh, and uh, like VRX Studios and Expedia they were based here all of the photography team for Expedia in Vancouver so we fl flew to different places around the world and uh, um, little by little I kind of fell in love with photographing spaces and photographing architecture and especially in Paris I saw a Corbusier house uh, one of the really really big uh, architects that is well known in the architectural uh, world and his houses were so modern and he worked in the 30s like and his houses were so modern I thought wow this man saw the future and to be honest the architects I work with they're they create incredible modern futuristic spaces and and this is one of the best things I can somehow have a glimpse of the future because we're moving very slowly uh, to the future I expected the uh, it's 2023. I expected flying cars at least, like by now. But uh, yeah, there's a few of them out there. There are few. It creates a lot of problems. <laughs> there's just not an Uber yet. There is a, no, no. I, I would never go on that probably. Uh, but uh, yeah, it just gave me opportunity to see the future somehow. So when you say Expedia, this is the Expedia.com that we use to Expedia.com. We used to go with uh, imagine they were used to like big cameras, photographers coming with crews to photograph the hotels. And suddenly when ex when they send us to shoot, we had a cool PX 5000 with 15 mega megapixel uh, cards and with a wide angle lens and with a panorama head. So we were doing all the virtual tours and the still images with this tiny bag of equipment. And you're going from a hotel to a hotel. Sometimes you're there for 14 days. If it's the big hotels in the Caribbean, like we were there for 14 days. But literally, I because you're one person and because you need to represent the hotel well, you're running around absolutely on your own trying to arrange swimming pools all the chairs to be arranged properly at the proper time restaurants you're steaming you're doing the beds with housekeeping so really it's like a boot camp for architecture and interior photography um and if you have the stamina to do it then nothing seems like a, a big deal in photography because um literally we got used to working 12 hour days um, and then afterwards we had to go and download and file and send. And like, so it was a very, very kind of grueling day, but we traveled all around the world. I was one day in Paris, one day in Berlin, one day on the Caribbean, you know, like it just 260 days a year I was on the road. So, um, it taught me a lot. And also it taught me how to communicate because when you're on your own and you have to deal from the general manager to the maid of a hotel, uh, like it, or housekeeper, like it just like it is so important for you to actually know how to present yourself and how to communicate what you need. And this to this day is super helpful for me. Yeah, rule number one is you got to make friends with the the, the housekeeper. <laughs> you know, oh, they'll look you up. Totally. <laughs> Totally. You're, you're like, rude to the housekeeper. Oof. Like head of housekeeping is probably like in the hotels your your main person because those beds they need to be perfect and and uh, yeah but it just it was it was incredible experience like and I became head of photography um, afterwards so I was responsible for the entire um, global team as well as I trained them and uh, I used to do all the guidelines for Fairmont for Hilton the the first guidelines that were done for the brands pretty much most like a majority of them were done with, with me and the branding teams. So what made you leave? Was it another job or is this when you went out on your own? No, this is when I, I actually worked two jobs at the same time. I, I worked for them and then I started my own firm. I saw a really beautiful modern space in Vancouver and I went and asked to photograph it. And I thought, okay, I really want to do I really want to do this. I want to catch modern spaces, beautiful design. So I worked two jobs uh, for a while to be able to actually support that dream because I didn't have the equipment. I didn't have um, 
I didn't have the connections yet. Nobody knew who I was in Vancouver. And I literally started with the builders. Um, I started working with builders and created really good relationships. And they might have 10 jobs that are not exceptional, but one will be exceptional. And this is the moment when you go in and you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do my utmost best. So the architect and the designer can see what I can achieve. And this is how my career got built. Because, and, and I feel there is one thing nowadays, uh, all the younger group is going in and trying to go to the top architects the moment they come out from school. You're shooting yourself in the foot the moment this happens, because unfortunately, yes, everything is instant nowadays. And my kids think the same, that everything is instant, but it's not. Because one time if an architect sees your poor work or they don't think that your work is good enough or you've recorded their project with specific base columns overlapping or something that they don't like, then you're done. Then you can find another job. You know, it's not it, it, with each city, no matter how big the city is, it's still a small, small environment, the different styles of photography. So I was uh, try to reiterate that when you start, you need to be an apprentice for a little bit, not to another photographer. Work with someone who's not at the top. Don't aim for the top people immediately. Nobody's waiting for you to show up. And the, everybody sometimes asks me, how are you? where you are, like, I mean, how quickly did, did this develop? It didn't. It developed slowly. And I put the work in it and the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about, it is true. You have to spend those 10,000 hours to actually be successful. Yeah, I think you broke up there for a second. So Sorry. how... So how often are you having to educate your clients that might not, you know, want to pay your day rate or might not understand why you're so expensive? Um, or is it pretty, is it pretty well known at your level and you don't have to kind of fight with negotiating price? I, I don't have to do it anymore. Like, I mean, yeah, maybe before this was the case, like, I mean, like you have to explain to a client how much it takes because unfortunately with the way um, I think that the realtors are kind of kind of the ones that are making a, a mess in our industry because they expect people can go in and out of a home for two hours, deliver 25 images in a high quality and be paid nothing. And, uh, but like in architecture world, like I feel the architects want to work with specific artists. They don't want to work with, they want to find their photographer, or find someone who can actually express their building or from the designers, people that understand how to do lighting. And when you create your style and people like your style, I mean, if you look at the kind of the top group in architecture, uh, Ian Van is more photojournalistic. Fernando Guerra is like, he, he is, the people are right in there in the middle of the shot. So he gets that human perspective really, really well. You have um, Cesar Bejar, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly, in Mexico, who does really beautiful muted filtered images. Um, so each of those people are recognized for their own style. And I think the architects gravitate to specific styles. How would you describe your style if you have one? Light. I think that um, when I'm looking at, do you know, I'm, I've been made to photograph sometimes more muted or like, like with crowds of people, like, and I can do it very easily. But the one thing that gets me is that perfect light. When you walk in and there's streaming lighting and it's like, it looks phenomenal. This is where I feel I make a difference because that's my passion. Like I love to see well lit interiors. And when I'm in situations where it's like, I mean, there go winter time, we had two incredible days with low light and it was streaming in, in a specific way. So I feel this is my, this is my um, strength. Are you ever building or using like an atmosphere or like type of fog or, or haze to kind of amplify like streaming light or is that well, yesterday <laughs> funny enough yesterday is the first time that this happened to me because it was minus temperatures and we were photographing an outdoors like wellness center so this and and 
when you put the steam up and the the streaming light is coming through, it was phenomenal. But like it just it doesn't suit every house or every location. I mean, fog is fantastic to shoot in. So like when it's foggy in Vancouver, this is the time. Like and we have light. We jump outside and try to photograph like a lot, but. I have to say, like for the houses, it's it's hard. You just work with whatever the conditions are in in that moment. But when it's foggy, it's it's stunning. That's awesome. So, in terms of getting new work, and especially like you know all throughout COVID and you know kind of being quarantined, how are you handling like your marketing? How are you doing your outreach? And how are you know you winning jobs in today's you know photography world? That's quite a bit different. Yeah, I mean the thing is, it's at this level. Um, I feel like we are kind of competing for specific jobs that are coming, some of the really big projects coming internationally. Um, and I think it still comes down to the architects liking my style more than somebody else's style uh, and also personal relationships. I think that the, one of the key things is actually creating really strong personal relationships with your clients and actually understanding them. Um, and I think through pandemic, I mean, for us, we still had quite a lot of work because, yes, we were quarantined, but outside we could walk out. And some of the shoots we did for developers were outside because they were very curious to see what it is without people, what it is we could photograph without cars on the streets. Like, you know, it was very unusual time, very spooky, but very unusual. And what I did is I did series of um, interviews, live stream interviews with all of the Vancouver interior designers. So um, I actually tried to fill my time. Uh, I wasn't only a teacher at home of two kids, um, but I tried to do the live streams as well. So in many ways, I feel um, I tried to keep up with the online presence as much as possible and showcase all different projects because everybody was at home. Everybody was was watching so that was the time to actually concentrate all of your marketing into into instagram or social media uh, and i did this the most i feel and this gave afterwards when the pandemic was over suddenly i had marketing teams from everywhere reaching out well this is a perfect time to share your instagram um if it's okay if i share your instagram with uh, the audience now so i am just going to Share my screen. Um, all right. So this last photo, um, yeah. is this personal work? Is this a job? And all of those I are jobs. Like I hardly, I hardly have personal work. I don't have time for personal. We literally work. I mean, we are booked solid for for this year and we're booking spring next year and it's almost fully booked so like it's it's like there is no this is one of the downfalls of this like if i can call that like uh, we don't have a lot of time for for actually personal work and i'm going to try to make time next year for a little bit of personal work um, but this is for an architect like uh, we work with them a lot they're extremely talented and uh, it's on an island uh, so you have to spend a day going there but it was it was incredible out of maybe like these last 12 to, you know, 20, which of these are your favorite? And like, what was like the best? Okay, story? so like the shot with the streaming light, which is, um, it's a commercial project. Yes, this is it. So I love this because this happens once a year, you know, and this happens in the winter time with streaming light. Um, so for me, it was just like I was like a kid in a candy store because you could play with absolutely all of the reflection, uh, all of the streaming light, all of the uh, shadows. So it's like positioning people will give you different shadows. And this is why I keep telling um, I, the one thing I try to convince architects sometimes is the location where they have to actually uh, the timing of the uh, location that we're photographing, because this photographed during the summertime had absolutely not the same impact. It was still beautiful, but had absolutely no, not the same impact. So it, without the streaming light, we will never get the shadowing. We will never get, get this dynamic of the light. And the light in the winter stays, that lower light stays for such a long time that you can play a lot. You can play for, I mean, here I had 
almost two hours. Well, in the summertime, the sun moves so quickly that like, even if we have streaming lights, I mean, this is the staircase. You see like those windows are facing um, south and they were giving this crazy light coming inside. And this is, like, and, and it was the funny thing was also um, the morning was foggy. So we could get this absolutely crazy atmospheric. I don't think, maybe I have one in there. Maybe I don't of the fog, but we had this crazy, look at this. Oh, yeah. This was the morning of. So you can create the most striking, um, crazy shot. You can show a building with all of its beauty in a different light with, with, with fog, with streaming light. And also like before the fog lifts, because it creates that overall, you have overall brightness, um, but the fog is still like staying low. You can also create this really crazy bounce of light on the windows of a building. So it's not just catching the fog and catching the sun. You have this mid range that was very exciting as well because it will never happen again. So unusual weather conditions for architectural photography are super important. I feel this is where a lot of people just going and shooting in sun. Don't go only in sun. Go, go in any weather. Like, I mean, we photographed in atmospheric river and I didn't believe we're going to get a good shot and we still got a good shot. Like, you know, so um, the sky's your limit in this situation. No pun intended. <laughs> so yeah. how often are you spending multiple days at locations like this because maybe the light wasn't perfect? To be honest, um, there once, once a year it happens. I can still make it work. And in many of the situations where traveling, I mean, I was... I was from Dubai, Dubai to Paris, to Spain, to everywhere. Like, and when you go there, you have to make it work. Um, I have to say we've been really lucky with the weather. Only with the forest fires um, this year in Winnipeg, I had to make out a day. Um, but otherwise, like in most cases, it works out. Like it will break. Even when we've had snowstorms, like, I mean, we had a snowstorm uh, in January in Ottawa and, um, early morning if you're there from early morning to late afternoon there will be a time that it will break uh, guaranteed like vancouver is an exception to have this crazy gray days for a very very long period of time um in most of the rest of the world like it would have breaks in the middle of the day and in in um i'll never forget in in ottawa we arrived at three o'clock two o'clock in the morning in a snowstorm the taxi could hardly get us to the hotel. And then we literally didn't sleep. And at 5 a.m. we went to the building and the, the sky broke for about two minutes. And we had the most incredible black sky on this white building and with pink, pink sunlight. Well, that image is enough, you know, like sometimes in crazy weather conditions, you could get the most beautiful shots. So I would say show up. This is my biggest motto. Show up. No matter what the situation yeah, is. Show up. And have your tripod set up, apparently. Have your tripod set up. Don't be scared of crazy weather. Like it just it's it's kind of I mean if you look at the um like look at this. I mean we waited for the entire day to get to get this is some of the reels that I do like because we we fly so much like I try to do a reel from time to time because I can't even keep up with where we've been or what we've done. So every three weeks I try to do a reel because um, literally the situations are crazy that we, we are in. I was in two hurricanes. I drove uh, on my own like recently, like um, I was in New Brunswick uh, for a shoot. I knew hurricane is coming. Um, and I still went back to Halifax to take my plane to go um, to Montreal. All the planes were canceled. And as a crazy person, I decided at 6 a.m. when literally the trees were bending over to rent a car and drive 13 hours from, um, from Halifax to Montreal on my own with no cars on the roads, with crazy storm to get to Montreal because I had a shoot on the next day. Wow. So who do you bring with you? Like who's on your team? Well, for like I have, um, I have Tina who works with me for years. She's with me for eight years, but like we are also branching the company. So like she's doing her own 
um like i mean she's doing shoots for me but like she's also shooting so now we are in a situation where we're both working we have three full-time image editors that do our work that work only for us and uh, now we got a person in between us um to actually help with assisting because it's hard and sometimes like i have to reach out uh locally if i'm going for a long period of time but there go i just did uh two weeks in spain i did um uh, um, two hospitals, a university, uh, like a commercial building and a residential uh, for two weeks, uh, for 12 days, really, with travel. And uh, I was on my own. So sometimes you just need to, especially for the commercial projects, you can handle it. Uh, you just need some sort of a support on site. You need uh, more like somebody to be on site with you rather than um, rather than like assisting. Residential is hard without the yeah. system, I have to say, because you need to move fast with the light. Uh, but commercial projects, you take your tripod, you put it on your shoulder, uh, and that's about it. You, you you just keep keep moving. This is quite interesting, yeah. Did so I hear you I was... say you have three full-time image editors? Yeah. Because wow. we shoot every day. You shoot it a lot. Yeah, we shoot a lot. And like the, uh, okay. one of our biggest problems wow. at the what moment. dream. Yeah. It's it's like I I don't know how to use Photoshop. I've never opened Photoshop in my life. Um, like Tina is never once. Mm, no, not Photoshop. I did. Uh, Tina is trying to show me Lightroom, um, which has been utterly unsuccessful. It I pay for a sus subscription, but I haven't yet figured out how to use it. Uh, I believe in doing what you're good at. I am never going to be good at sitting on a desk trying to do images i'm good at action i'm good when you put me in a crazy situation in an action i mean that shot that you just showed with the with the thunder yeah. so so there was an electric thunderstorm um and i'm running around this is uh saint regis uh in Kanai, uh a huge resort we're photographing it and i'm running around in a ma like mangrove like there, literally there's mangrove around me with a metal tripod in the middle of a thunderstorm. But how can you resist not taking those shots? You know, this is not superimposed. This is, I have a video of me taking that shot. I was holding the, the phone and taking the shot at the same time. You need to just time it properly when, when the, the lighting comes. So, and know what exposures to use, of course. Um, but I think that I thrive on adrenaline and I love being in those extreme situations, rooftops, hanging from buildings, like, having a storm, doing something that is completely unusual. I, I find sometimes life boring without all of this. So what is your shutter speed here? Like, this seems like very, okay. especially if you're handheld. It's fast. It's not handheld. I never work handheld. Um, like I'm on a tripod. Okay. Uh, so like I did all of the exposures uh, for the building on a higher, on a regular, like, I mean, I would say anywhere between 11 and 18 f-stop. And of course, lower, lower shutter speed. And then for when I, I tried to catch the sky, I did much faster. So I increased, I, I think I'm at 1600 ISO. I will be at 2.8 or at 4 uh, f-stop. So because you can't catch it uh, on a slow shutter speed, you have to increase your shutter speed quite a lot. I don't remember what the shutter speed exactly it was, but it would be a, like a, like 200 somewhere. Um, because you need to catch it. Uh, and this is where yeah. sometimes you need to have that technical skill. We had the same situation with, um, we were photographing a location. Um, it was a biodome and it had a waterfall, but I had to blur the people because we were not allowed to show faces. So the waterfall had to be shot on a quite a, like a high uh, shutter speed to actually not get completely blurred because it was a thin waterfall. So we had to shoot on higher shutter speed for that and then shoot on a lower shutter speed to be able to get the blurred people. So sometimes you need to actually read your environment a little bit to be able to understand um, how to make every element look good and your verticals have to be straight. And like so architectural photography is a lot of thinking, um, but you have to think fast in situations like this. Yeah. I mean, to catch lightning, you have to have a pretty quick reaction. <laughs> oh, I got a lot of lightning. I got the whole shot that the entire building is lit by by the lightning. That's amazing. What has been your favorite shoot this year so far? 
my favorite shoot there are a lot like I, I would say like this year has been absolutely spectacular I mean um, there was a university in Spain that I connected with a lot like uh, Loyola by um, uh, like one of the big uh, Spanish architects Luis Vidal like uh, I just everything there worked um, literally like for a big commercial space like I have a lot of favorite residential this year because like every residential has been pretty exceptional uh, but from the commercial, I definitely feel um, this one was just the lighting was so perfect. Um, the students were very much willing to jump into every shot. Uh, so it's kind of all elements. You have shoots in which all elements come together. The lights, the building, the the people, everything works very effortlessly. And that building definitely was one of one of those. So for shots like this, are you ever replacing the sky? No. If let's say, you know, this was just a, a blank sky with without these, you know, kind of perfectly pink clouds. Are you ever mocking in or having your maybe two shots. mock them in? Maybe two shots in my entire career. And one of them was because um we were waiting for a spectacular sunset for days. And then this spectacular sunset didn't happen and I had to leave. I, I was um, somewhere internationally. And unfortunately, nowadays, every single person has a camera on their phone. So there was a woman that, that works in an office opposite the building that I was photographing. So she's there every day on her desk. So she managed to catch the most perfect sunset of this building and tag the architect, posted on Instagram. Great. What happens is the architect sends me a message and says, Emma, can you catch this? And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to try to catch like once in a year sunset in a shot that somebody actually goes, just photographs like from their office window. So th sometimes the fact that people are tagging the architects is so unhelpful because we can't recreate something like this. So this is the one time I really had to had to do uh, like Photoshop. So we make it look very similar to what he wanted. Nice. So and this is the shot, the pink stop, shot. Uh, do you see the pink shot? Uh, I, I don't know whether you saw it, but there was a pink shot with the which I was explaining to you on the screen. Oh, with yeah. You want me to share it? Oh, no, I'm just I'm just saying. Oh, OK, so um. In terms of, you know, at ProEDU, we have a, a huge audience of people either already working as pros or trying to kind of get to where you're at. So yeah. what advice would you have for people like, you know, trying to get into architecture photography or, or even real estate, you know, photography and, and shooting interiors? Um, yeah. Whether, you know, they're just starting out or maybe they're one or two years in. Well, it is a very competitive industry, from what I've understood about the um, uh, real estate photographers. Um, like, it, it seems there it's so hard. It has to be personal connections. You have to connect with, the, with some of those people. Uh, so it's probably easier to get in, but it is extremely competitive as a job, and you have to be really fast. Um, I admire real estate photographers tremendously. Like, um, like I mean, sometimes people think that there is this looking down or anything like this because we do architecture. That's not true. I won't be able to do what they're doing. Like, I'm in awe. I, I almost told a couple of them, can I come with you so I can understand how can you shoot a, a house for two hours and pull out great images? And, like, you have to really be on it. Like, so... I think they're already there from the real estate group. Like they just like it's the opportunities given in the relationships. So I think sometimes it's understanding business as well, because in architecture, yes, the style helps, the relationships help, but you're not only there for, for photographing, you're there for understanding the marketing needs of a firm, because depending on your photos, um, your client is either going to get more work or it's not going to get more work. Depending on your photos, your client might sell a house or not not sell a house. Um, you know, I think that we are looking at 
too, we're in a bubble. We're always looking at it as, oh, like I'm doing all this photography and like, well, why is nobody paying me attention? It's not about this. Once you understand what people really want, whether it's creatively or from a marketing perspective, you kind of need to bring in the full package. You need to understand the architect or try to understand the architect because some of them I, I, I still am working on after 10 years of relationship of understanding their creative passions. And I mean, sometimes it's important to listen to their music, to understand the books that they love, to understand everything else, because that makes you connected in a different way. Like how I was created, connected with my dad, you know, I understood him as a creative. And I think that um, we don't put the time to learn who people are, to understand them. We don't put the time to understand what the times are and what is needed from us to change. Like we need to be one step ahead of everyone else. We need to also understand very well marketing and branding. And I think a lot of people should be putting a lot more effort into their business side and understanding business rather than only trying to update the gear. Nothing's going to happen when you update the gear. I've seen people that use the worst gear and they're doing incredible work and they're hired over and over and over. I mean, like one of the top photographers in our industry, he doesn't use a tripod like ever. So I, I, I can't oh, even wow. imagine this, you know, like, so, so yeah, I think that it's a package. So you, you can't look at it one dimensionally. You need to actually buy the Harvard business review, read a couple of articles about business, buy some of the business books, understand what's going on in the world. Like it, try to be more of a rounded human. We, we are creatives and it's very hard. It's almost like a dirty word business. And, and marketing and understanding all of this. But without it, you're not going to get anywhere. Are you worried at all? You know, CGI has been around forever. And, you know, huge companies like Ikea, their entire catalog has been CGI for a decade. Are you worried about CGI and now AI, like maybe taking away um, work from you? Or do architects not want to use you know that media i think i think change is going to happen you just need to to work with the time so like how can you make your work work with all of this you know like you need to actually adjust the way you're shooting because things will change and like we can't fight change that's about it like in my lifetime there's so much change that has happened as well and we adapt it we adapt it to everything i don't think that if you actually creatively figure out a way to march your work with all of the technology that is coming in that anyone can touch you because at the end of the day they can use yeah. renderings otherwise why are they not using renderings people still want to see real life no matter what and people really want to see their work so um i think it will change things but i think also we need to change with the times So what's no. next for you? What are you most looking forward to in the next year? Do you have any personal work? I know you said you don't really shoot personal work. Do you have any like huge jobs that you're just absolutely looking forward to? Yeah, we have we, co we have quite a few projects. Um, like I have a couple of amazing hotels that I'm going to be photographing in, uh, in Mexico that I'm really looking forward to because they're kind of, it's just, it's such a large scale, like trying to photograph something like this and make it look like, dramatic and romantic is so it's so much fun um we're doing quite a few big commercial projects in europe as well uh that would be would be fantastic but i think i'm looking forward to i did a couple of exhibitions recently and i've realized the one thing i really used to love is walk around the city and paris especially with my camera and take photos and i realized the last exhibition four of the shots there out of what's 16, 17 big, big prints, four of them are done on the same day in Milan, me walking around. And um, I feel this is the boredom, like the walking around a city with a camera, like being, being not always on the go for projects is what I'm looking forward to the most. So I'm trying to integrate a couple of weeks of me going to locations that I really love in Europe and actually walking around with my camera. Because we sometimes forget with all of this busy North American, especially life, that we can actually 
what we used to enjoy. And that was the thing I enjoyed the most was on my own with a camera, a whole day walking, catching little moments, like more street photography. So I'm, I'm thinking of doing a couple of those. And we have several art projects that we're thinking of doing now that I'm considered an artist. Um, so um, yeah, just implementing those because they always stay in your head and you always think, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to do this next year or next year or next year. So I think like just saying, okay, no, don't delay the things you really want to do because life is short to say the least. Yes, it is. So is your walking around camera the same as your commercial camera? And, you know, I don't think we touched on what, what is your camera? Like and what's your go-to lens? Well, like for architecture, go-to lens is 17 millimeter tilt shift, of course, or 24 millimeter tilt shift. Like our verticals have to be completely straight. Um, I'm using uh, Canon, Canon gear, uh, the mirrorless Canon. And uh, like one of the hardest things at the moment is that the tilt shifts are not, we have to use an adapter for the tilt shifts because they didn't come out with tilt shifts that can be put on the same mount. So we have to use an adapter, which has been, and I'm looking forward to Canon coming out with the new tilt shifts. They're talking about automatic tilt shifts as well. Um, but yeah, I, I use the same gear. Like um, I'm thinking actually of changing and having something smaller with me because like a Leica will be perfect. Uh, something that I can actually be more discreet with because like when I pull out my camera in any location, even if I'm very discreet, it's still like it's still visible. I remember the Magnum photographers used to carry Lycos with them everywhere, even when we were working in the office. Like you will have a camera on the corner. Like if, you, if you're actually really good at seeing kind of with your peripheral vision, there'll be somebody photographing you at any point of time. Um, so I feel I feel that the Leica will be probably the way to go for me um, to just change things a little bit. So if Canon didn't come out with the, you know, the two main tilt shifts for mirrorless, what was it about mirrorless that made you want to make that switch? You will laugh. So it's nothing technical, to be honest, because uh, like there were bigger, bigger megapixels. I don't know, psychologically, with the amount of clicks we, we do, um, because like, I mean, I shoot every day. I'm booked every day. So I do, in average, probably about two to three to 4,000 presses a day. So this wears the shutter so quickly. So I always imagine somehow psychologically that the mirror is going to one day, and it has like a couple of times give up. So I, I always think about mirrorless cameras better because they're not going to somehow break with the extreme usage we, we do. So that was primarily why I changed. It was a megapixel, so I have bigger megapixels. <laughs> Like it just, I accept you know, that reason. <laughs> psychologically, I'm always like, okay. So was yeah. there anything? Yeah. Was there anything weird about the electro, uh, the EVF um, electronic viewfinder that was different than you know actually looking through and kind of seeing? It's looking you know, through. Your, yeah. Your no, I. Th no, I think that's like. I mean, honestly, like. Do you know, it's funny, I don't really look at cameras this way. Like I look at it as a mean to actually get to somewhere. And as long as I have a really high resolution and they operate in a normal way, the one thing I love about the camera I have at the moment is the screen actually at the back could be moved because sometimes my head is in crazy positions and I can't see through the viewfinder. So having that ability um, has been fantastic. Otherwise, nothing technical, I feel, you know, when you, you're... When you've worked with old Russian cameras, honestly, like for me, the camera is literally a mean to catch something like so all of the technical aspects, as long as they provide me with a high resolution enough to blow images sometimes to fairly big um, and it's good print quality for the publications, that's kind of my main goal. Nice, nice. Definitely so not. We're going to go to. A... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. It's, not, it's, it's, it's a very different way of looking at it. I never look yeah, at no, any I, aspect. I think this is such a, like a lot of the photographers are looking at the different technical aspects. I feel like I'm more, is it going to give me enough resolution? Is it going to the shutter be fast enough? Like in some situations, that's kind of my main goal. Yeah. I mean, I think today, especially with photographers coming up, that there's just so much news about more megapixels, the newer camera, 
I mean, in reality, like if Ansel Adams took a better photo with you with a 300 pound camera, you know, 80 years ago, like, do you really need it? You know, so it's, you know, I, the photographers that I've met that like absolutely don't really know that much about cameras are usually the best. And they're just like, is it going to do the one or two things that I need? And like, I don't really care about all the features because there's so many like technical aspects, like oh, no. the Sony I, I menu systems. That. Holy yes. cow. <laughs> I don't know what half the stuff is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, honestly, like the next, whatever comes next, primarily for actually getting the best quality. That's, that's the, the main thing. Like I don't play with it a lot. Nice, nice. So I'm going to go to a quick commercial break and I'm going to check in with Michael and see if there are any questions. And then after that, um, we'll wrap up and uh, we'll go from there. So. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my uh, camera and uh, I'm going to play an architecture commercial. I think it takes a special eye to see spatial relationships in a building. And I think that architecture photographers share that with architects. I think the story that we need to tell is twofold. One is that original vision of the architect. The second part of that is really how it feels when you're standing inside of that space. So this tutorial really does contain everything. Not only do we have pre-pro and a scout, we could back up and do a 35. We gotta move this probably. But we also talk about pricing, shooting, and a lot of the different challenges that you'll encounter in commercial spaces. Now, both of those conference rooms are wrapped in glass, so we have some glare we're gonna have to handle. Then we go through post-production, not only my process, but we bring Barry McKenzie to go through that process, which is really how I work. I think if we made a selection around this in post, all the way around that, dropped in an office view, at least have it. Okay, let's do it. I have someone take my images 80 to 90%, and then I put that last finishing special sauce on them before I deliver them to a client. First deliverable image. I think it looks good. Clients should be stoked with that. The space we chose for this tutorial is a space that I think a lot of architecture photographers are gonna be able to relate to. There's a lot of breakout spaces and bold colors and glass, windows, natural daylight. We have a lot of glare down there. We're gonna to have to close the blind. Polished concrete floors. These are all design elements that I've been seeing over the last couple years on a repetitive basis. Concrete is picking up all kinds of reflections and glare. I felt comfortable that this space would present enough challenges and enough commonality in the types of spaces that people would find when they got out there and started photographing spaces. The problem with this is that those bold colors are contaminating those white walls, which means we're gonna have to do some post work to get rid of that color cast. The other thing is pricing, and that is something that you just can't find anywhere. I'm gonna break it down here in the tutorial, teach you exactly how cost sharing works so that you can go out, implement it to your business practices and build your client base as well. Emotion and storytelling really are what commercial architecture photography is all about. It's our job as photographers to translate the emotion of a space into a two-dimensional image. If you can invoke emotion in an architect, that really is what will set you apart from the competition. Make images that architects can connect with. All right. So, and 
Yeah, that was our architecture uh, tutorial we did with Tony Roseland, and uh, the retouching was with Barry uh, McKenzie. Barry's. Um, we're actually in the building. We're actually in the building that's uh, that we photographed. Um, it's awesome right now. So, uh, a couple questions. Uh, when are you teaching a workshop and how do I get to it? Um, so I'm doing a first workshop actually, um, like in, in, um, a couple of days, but like, it's already sold out It's part of a conference, um, in Las Vegas. And, um, we are actually thinking of doing something. Uh, and it's slowly in the works because a lot of people are asking. I haven't mentored people yet or do, done anything because it just it's time doesn't allow it. But it's gonna be it's gonna be out there um, soon. Like I would say, middle next year, we're gonna we're gonna do something. It will be very limited. I'm gonna probably take ten or fifteen people that I would want to help. Uh, but it will be more of a mentorship program rather than a tutorial. Nice. Um, the next one was from Kelly. Um, how do I become an assistant for someone like you? Okay. So, so like most of the people that are established will have assistants. Um, so we have lists of people that like, I mean, send us their information or want to help. And usually it is more um, us having the need in that moment to have somebody on site with us because in private homes, it's so hard to have additional people. So we have our team, but it's hard to bring in someone. On the commercial projects, we try to bring in um, interns and we try to bring in people. Uh, but it's the right timing. If you're, I mean, there you go. We had a right timing where um, literally both Tina and I now are, are shooting under the same brand. But like we needed someone to be actually with one or the other because we're both on site. So those are the, those opportunities. So you need to keep in touch, I think, more than anything, because as much as I want to say, like, yeah, we are looking at the list for sure. And what, this is what we did when we chose somebody. But um, again, it's the right timing, like to actually hit the right timing with, uh, with the team uh, when we need someone. Nice. Uh, the next one is about pricing. Um, yeah. Sounds like this person is good at photography and they're you know starting to kind of get clients but they struggle with knowing how to price themselves so what advice would you have for someone who's kind of struggling with like coming up with pricing well um pricing is a very it's a very different thing for first of all in different markets um second of all like i mean some of the let's say la photographers tell you oh this is what you need to charge but that's not the case when you're somewhere in the middle of America, like, you know, or when you're in mid Canada, like, I mean, some of the firms cannot afford like those specific rates. So you need to know, um, I would say the way I would approach it. I mean, I know what my competitors uh, charge. I know internationally what my competitors charge. I know what uh, my competitors charge locally, as well as I know what their li everybody's licensing fees are. And depending on where you are in your life uh, and how sought after you are, then this is the moment when you when you have to be probably a little bit above the local market because if you're pr providing your clients exclusivity and you're working only with specific clients, this is the moment when you have to up the rates as well. Um, but it it is so local, like because you can't be competitive in a local market or in your regional market if you don't understand what other people's are people are charging and they're 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 totally waste i mean some of the photographers are flat out honest what they're charging uh and sometimes when you're on a bid with other people you can you can you can ask the client like was it cost and then they'll explain to you asking feedback why you weren't hired is not a bad thing just saying thank you i really appreciate why you being considered i would love to know is cost part of it or not? Like people are there to to help you. We always are scared to ask clients for things, but I think it's worth it asking. So it is a it's a it's very regional or depending on your status, international and regional like type of a approach. Nice. Uh, the next one is about um, representation or getting a photo agent. Yeah. Um, question is. Do you have a photo agent? And if so, when, when and how did you get one? Um, and then the second part to this question is, 
do the traditional books like Lurzer's Archive or Workbook, are these still things that work? And is this something that you do? So, so agent, no. I have a lot of people that are approaching now asking me to be part of specific agencies, but um, no, I think I, I pretty much did my own marketing and I established a brand myself. Uh, if you're good at it, go for it. You need to actually like kind of know how to position, position yourself. Uh, but if you don't, I think an agent is a good idea. The thing is the agents will pick up only specific people. So um, you still have to be really good, but not understand business well to actually have an agent. And this is like a really good moment for you to have someone. And yeah, to be honest, like, um, like recently I looked at a couple of agencies because I want to go to to more to Europe and photograph incredible old buildings and, and do some of those projects that's like, I mean, I'm known for specific things. I'm known for modern architecture, I'm known for larger scale kind of projects and really modern or like residential. So you can even see when you post on your social media, something that it's like a little bit different, how people don't react to it. So you've built yourself a, uh, like an audience that expects from you to see something. And, and this is where you need to understand your niche market. You need to understand like exactly who you need to approach. So if you can't generate the business, an agency is a good way to go, depending whether you're good enough, because they're not going to pick you up. And um, the other things that you said, I don't even know what they are. Like books and so like, the like traditional do you buy advertising in any of like workbook or Lurzer's archive? Um, you know, those very traditional, like the highest level. No, no, I, I pretty don't need much. It. So Instagram number, Instagram number one, LinkedIn. Do and a, uh, do, so do you have a printed book? Mm -hmm. No. Do you print your work in like a book that you, a portfolio that you take around and show? No, Who? nobody has no. time for all of this. Like, I don't know. You have, <laughs> yeah, I know, you right? You have to sit and look at other people's books and things like this. Can you imagine being a marketing manager of an architectural firm or an interior design firm and you have to do like 20 proposals that month and then you have to look at somebody's photography? No, you need to be impactful in social media and you need to actually stop people in, in their tracks when they're looking through like their morning because truth be told we wake up and what do we do like where's the phone where's instagram or where's like you want to have a look what's going on and i think that to stay current you need to actually be different and you need to stop people in their tracks and this is the way you get attention like honestly like like some of the older architects appreciate like books and portfolios being sent and all of this but the rest of the world doesn't have time to take a breath. So you're not on their mind whatsoever. So you'll be on their mind if they see you being published everywhere, if they see you being like your images being more shocking in social media or really striking. Or at the moment, there is a lot of psychological research about um, how people look at images in social media. And what they're looking for actually is calm and, and zen and like some sort of a because we're bombarded all the time by so much imagery, they want to stop at something that will make them feel calm. So do you know this research? Like when you're working, do you know what people want to see like on social media? So I, I think it's such a diverse aspect on how to, to stay on top of it, but it is more about understanding how your um, target market is actually reacting to your images and it will be primarily in a momentary way in, in social media rather than in, I'm going to spend an hour looking at this book. Nice. Uh, the last, <laughs> it's not really a question, it's more of a statement, but um, you're my hero. I don't want to learn Lightroom or Photoshop either. I just want to shoot. <laughs> so I think oh, you yeah. inspired some people out there that don't like yeah. to sit down and I didn't have money. I had no money. I had no car. I had no equipment. I had an image editor. You know, like it's just how you set yourself up. Like everybody who's successful sets their businesses up in a specific way. My downfall is invoicing. So so like you need to understand or 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 Photoshop. Like, you know, I don't want to do this. So then your this is your moment when you say, okay, what am I good at? Why do I need to split my time doing multiple things? Find somebody who will actually do a good job. Find a student, train them, teach them how you wanna uh, you wanna do it. And I literally, like, honestly, I 
I that's why I worked two jobs because I was paying the image editor more than I was I was getting in the beginning. But I never ever from the first moment had had um, like I never did any of that work. And look, I, I love it. I love it. it. Was right, like it was right next to me. This is the Sekonic, the old Sekonics. Like it's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, where do you want everyone to follow you on TikTok, Snapchat? <laughs> you on all the above or just Instagram? TikTok, but it's just like I don't, I don't have time for it. But it's like I'm on Instagram. Like I'm on Inst uh, Like um, Instagram is is the way to go. Like, and I, I just love it. I love Instagram a lot. So, like, yeah, Instagram is the place I would say, and LinkedIn, of course, but Instagram primarily. I love that. Well, Emma, I am jealous at how much you get to travel and try new food on a daily basis. Uh, so if you ever need an assistant, just call me. I will do. <laughs> if you're over in St. Louis, in definitely. Vancouver. I'll see you in Vancouver, hopefully, like um, in a couple Absolutely. months. Absolutely. Absolutely. That sounds good. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to end it here and go to our um, outro. And uh, thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Thank you for having me. This podcast is officially over. See you next time. Catch you a little later on down the trail, dude. Thanks for listening. I get out of here and start shooting. I can remember very distinctly one of the very first classes. You had to take um, one roll of film and, and tell a story. And you got, you know, four by six prints made of them and you put them on the wall. I remember watching some of the people's images go up on the board and being like, Oh my God, what did I get myself into? These people are so talented. I was a DJ. I worked a lot at night. Sort of felt that itch to do something else. And after some soul searching, the only thing that I was excited about doing was taking pictures. And I, I would Photoshop myself into other places. And a lot of times it never even went online. I didn't care because it wasn't for necessarily the world. It was because I wished I was anywhere other than where I was. I suppose academically I failed everything, so I was left with very few choices. Uh, I was cater waitering. I'd work till you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night, retouch until three or four in the morning. Even though I didn't really have the talent, I'd be willing to work when other people would sleep. And at times I look at my work and I think, damn, I'm a shitty photographer, fuck, it's nothing. You know, you have this idea of what can be done because you're assisting and you just can't create it. You know, so often today as artists, I think we get ideas and we end up sitting on them and we don't follow through. I think we're, we can be our worst enemies. I will talk myself out of a project before I even begin it because I think about all the things that might go wrong or could go wrong. When you first start out with doing anything, you know, you've got like five people, you know, one of those is your mum following you and it's just like difficult to get accurate feedback. You have to be willing to be rejected by the artwork, by yourself, by your peers. We get worried what our peers are going to think. We get worried what the talent is going to think or what the celebrity is going to think. And for me, it was always like, I understand that, but I also understand that you have to be passionate enough to throw the excuses aside and just start the process. First struggling, then assisting full-time for three years, then struggling some more, then retouching, freelancing, getting my first job. But I'll lay in bed and something will just pop in my head and I just go, what if? Wouldn't it be interesting if? Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it works, it works, it doesn't work, throw it out. You know, you don't become a great photographer, you don't become a great painter, you don't become a great sculptor without having some downfalls and, and, and going in the wrong direction. I allow myself to fail because I like to fail because I like to grow. But you have to decide that you want it because it's not easy to be great at anything. Even though I'm not at the place I want to be, I'm still moving forward. Nobody's going to love everything that we do. But I think you have to take a chance.